This episode features the work of a brewer or distiller and is intended for viewers of legal drinking age. Please enjoy craft beverages responsibly. Thank you. Um, I think that is sometimes the beers can be intimidating and then once you have them, they're not, they're not what you necessarily read right away into mm -hmm. them. Um, and that's the whole purpose of it is to add character to the beer once again without you know taking away from um, the beer itself. Mm -hmm. Welcome back everyone. I'm Sarah Scully with Vermont Craft Tours and today I'm at Bent Hill Brewery with Mike Zock, owner and brewery. Hi Mike, thanks for being here with me. Hi, nice to be here. Um, and so Mike, how long have you had the brewery up and running? Uh, the brewery will have been open three and a half years right now. Okay, yeah, so it's it's January of 2018 we're shooting this. Um, and Mike's really known for his creativity with his um, flavor combinations and his beer. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Mike, I wanted to ask you um, initially, how did you get started with brewing? Uh, I assume you were a home brewer before you were a professional brewer. Uh, I was a home brewer. So I started just like any home brewer in my kitchen um, when I was in college and just kind of slowly developed from there. Mm -hmm. And what inspired you to, to keep going with it? I know a lot of people, you know, they try like a kid or something and then they go, eh, that was fun and that's it. Uh, I think what inspired me was just the creativity of it and um, my mindset of how I just like hands on things. Mm -hmm. um, and it just caught really quickly yeah. and just enjoyed it. So mm -hmm. I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and then what about going pro? Again, a lot of people do it for a hobby, and that's, you know, the speed that they want to maintain. Um, Scott, I just talked to Scott, and he's been doing it for like 30 years, never professionally. Um, but I've also talked to a couple of the other small uh, breweries in Tunbridge, and they, you know, made that progressive. So what, um, what inspired you to go professional? Today? Uh, I think it was a few different things. Probably it was a change in a moment in my life, and... Um, loved it mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of at a new era in time where things were really starting to boom in the brewing industry um, that wasn't necessarily a big draw for me I didn't really know about that at the time mm -hmm. uh, but just kept wanting to brew more beer and I wanted to find a way to continue to do it um, and that seemed to be the logical step I wasn't living in Vermont at the time and uh, I wanted to figure out a way to come back here mm -hmm. and uh, it all kind of just snowballed on itself and you know here we are three and a half years later. <laughs> That's great. I was really uh, excited when, when you started and then to see your progression over the last couple of years. It's been a lot of fun um, seeing you get into more you know local restaurants and on more shelves in different markets. Um, it's been really great. So as I mentioned Mike's really known for his um, unusual or you know uh, different fl uh, flavor combinations uh, in his beer um, Mike tell us a little bit about that like what what inspires you to come up with a new a new style of beer or a new flavor that's a hard question um, <laughs> you know a lot of times it's not necessarily something that I'm premeditating um, a lot of times it's I just come in and somebody gives me the inspiration for something or um, I just like the idea of how things sound together and I found a way to put them together. Mm -hmm. um, to me it's about putting ingredients together that blend well um, and don't overpower the palate uh, while still leaving the beer intact. And, right. Uh, it's just kind of something I think I've developed over time. I've kind of been brewing that way from the beginning and um, I've never really strayed too far away from that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that we've increased production and that's cut back a little bit, we still have quite a few beers that are made with some very strange things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you give us an example? Uh, well, currently today I'm brewing a beer with cherries and graham crackers, uh, I brew beer with chaga mushroom, black truffle mushrooms, um, let's see, lavender all the time, blood oranges, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, raisins, jeez, uh, you have some chili beer too. Yes, yeah. chili coconut cinnamon stout. Um, I think at this point we probably have about 80 to 100 beers. Um, mm. and most of them all have some kind of different variant to them mm -hmm. um, in ingredient. Right. And what I've noticed as your customer is that you do a really good job of pairing the flavor that you're adding to the style of beer. 
So like the coconut porter. Well, porters can be kind of chocolatey, so and coconut naturally goes with that chocolatey taste. So that's a really good match. Or blood orange IPA. You know, IPAs often have a citrusy profile from the hops, so why not add some citrus juice to it? So I think that's the thing is that even if you you might read the label and be a little bit timid about trying it for the first time, but um, your your combinations there with your base style and then your addition of other flavors really works well. I think so. I think uh, I think that is sometimes the beers can be intimidating, and then once you have them, they're not they're not what you necessarily read right away into mm-hmm. them. Um, and that's the whole purpose of it is to add character to the beer once again without you know taking away from um, the beer itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know that you use the actual um, raw material. I'll say of of whatever it is that you're adding, so you don't use like fake flavoring or anything to no. change these flavors. You really roast the peaches or shred the coconut or whatever it is. Yeah, we do everything. There's we use no extracts. Mm-hmm. Um, it just doesn't provide a real character, and for me, it's really distinct mm-hmm. uh, when you use something that's an extract. Yeah. Yeah, it can kind of, like you said, overpower the, the intent of the beer itself. Um, so what do you have? Uh, we were just talking off camera before we started. Uh, Mike was mentioning um, what a busy time it's been. Um, what, what exciting projects do you have for 2018 that you can share? Um, well, <laughs> some stuff's still under the wraps. Mm-hmm. Um, we're looking to expand a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, right now we're... Brewing on our still have our three barrel system or double batching into seven barrel tanks. So um, we're going to be getting, you know, probably four more seven barrels mm-hmm. um, to increase our capacity some more. Um, hopefully, start reaching out a little bit further in the state of Vermont. Um, we might be working with a distributor out of Portland, Maine mm-hmm. um, to try to start getting some product up there, mm-hmm. uh, maybe once a year, or, you know, twice a year, something like that. Um, and then we're hoping to revamp our barrel aging program. Okay, and tell us a little bit more about that. What what styles are you barrel aging? Uh, right now, we're predominantly going to be doing barrel aged stouts, mm-hmm. um, and then okay. what we're planning to do is start dipping into some more of the barrel aged sours. Okay, yep, great. Well, um, I think we're going to take a quick break here, get set up to taste one or two beers, and we'll be right back with you. Thank you. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're going to taste a couple of porters that Mike's made recently. So um, the first one is a coffee. Uh, so this right? one's called Some Infinite Thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a it's a light body porter. Um, it's only 5%. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one we brewed and then aged on carrier roasting coffee. So it's got 15 mm-hmm. pounds of uh, just fresh bean coffee that we aged on for about two weeks. Oh, wow. And then uh, 50 pounds of coconut and just mm-hmm. a little hint of cinnamon in there. Okay, yeah. Lovely. Cheers. Mm. Yeah, this is one of my favorites right now. Yeah. Let's see why. The coffee really comes out, but it's not. Um, it's not acidic, I guess, because you use that kind of cold brew method. Not it's cold like, brew. Or, uh, just sunny. unground coffee. Just, oh, just, just holding. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, I don't like grinding the coffee. It makes a mess, mm-hmm. and then also it tends to bring out the acidity in the beer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because this is much smoother than a lot of coffee beers that I've had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you don't really taste the cinnamon, or at least I don't, but it's just like a warm quality that sort of goes down your throat. So yeah, it's really light into mm-hmm. cinnamon. It's not supposed to be anything yeah. too crazy. And I, right. I didn't want it too spicy, and that's the thing mm-hmm. about cinnamon is it, it can take over really fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. It's delicious. See how that would maybe change. I'll let it warm up a little bit. Have another sip in a minute. And open up a little bit at a warmer temperature. Porters are my favorite. I think all around. I mean, I think I predominantly brew porters. All around beer. <laughs> I use some stouts, but if they're going to be stouts, they're going to be pretty burly. And right. then, um, you know, other than that, some IPAs. But the mm-hmm. main majority of um, mm-hmm. dark beers that I'm doing is porters. Yep. Yeah, I love your uh, your blood orange IPA is my definitely in my top three IPAs of all time yeah. of every brewery. We uh, it's yeah, really, we really good. Been, we haven't brewed that. Well, we're not planning to brew another batch of it until late March, <clears throat> right now. 
um, until yep. we get our new tanks in. Mm -hmm. We try to concentrate on just some winter safe theme mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That's pretty nice. Mm. It's changing, even just in a few minutes. So you said coffee, coconut, a hint of cinnamon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the coconut's a little more sweet. Mm -hmm. It kind of is a little sweet coconut um, and a little bit of roasty effect from it as well. I'd say the yeah. coffee is the most pronounced thing in there, but that's yep. the whole idea behind it. Right. It was a lot of coffee. Yeah. You do get, I think you get both coffee and coconut at the beginning, and then the coconut kind of fades. The coffee kind of hangs out for a minute, and then it just goes into this warm thing at the end. It's really nice. Delicious. All right, so let's taste the cherry beer. So another porter looks similar. Slightly lighter colored head on this one. So this was a little sweeter. Mm -hmm. um, my palate, the first thing I identify is a little bit of cherries. Yep. Right up front. Yep. Um, so this has a hundred pounds of cherries in it in a seven mm. barrel batch, which isn't a whole lot. Um, but we didn't want the cherries to be too overwhelming. It's not supposed right. to be like a sweet beer. Um, it's not sweet, and it's not like a lambic or something. No, um, it's it not, not, not that, that much cherry. That intense um, cherry. It's like a yeah. It's a nice mellow cherry taste. It's just right there, mm -hmm. and it's just enough. Um, and then it's aged on cacao, so. So some nice dark chocolate notes to it and a little bit yep. of coffee tone. Yep. Again, it's kind of like cherry, and then a little less cherry, and then a little, oh, there's some chocolate. Mmm. It's very nice. How long do you um, typically age your beers, or does it depend from beer to beer before you release them? It's de it's dependent on the beer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, most of our IPAs are in a cycle of about three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the dark beers tend to be two and a half weeks, but sometimes can be a month, depending on what we're putting into them. Um, these two beers that we just tasted, after primary, needed almost three weeks of aging mm -hmm. um, before we did any packaging with them. Right. Yeah. Cool. And tell us a little bit more about where people can get your beer. Um, you're distributed in Vermont now? So, I mean, we pretty much distribute all the way up to St. Albans, down to Windsor right now. Mm -hmm. um, packaged, can can beers more readily available than draft beer, but um, our draft beer is pretty well um, available throughout uh, Upper Valley um, mm -hmm. and then Central Vermont, and then as you go north, it fades out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> most of the big package stores um, along 89 corridor and then along 100, mm -hmm. um, not down to Killington, but, uh, north, mm -hmm. uh, you can find it. Craft beer cellar, still public house, uh, beverage warehouse, yeah. city market in Burlington. Oh, great. So yeah, so if you're coming up for, you know, skiing or something, check that out. Be sure to take some home for a souvenir. Um, like I said, there may be some more famous breweries out there from Vermont, but, um, Bent Hill is right at the top of my personal list, so check it out. Um, Mike also has uh, tasting hours uh, regularly, so we'll post those at the show notes, um, as well as links to places you can find information about him online. And uh, thanks again for taking the time today, Mike. I really had a good time talking and tasting beer. So Thank cheers. You. Thanks for having me.